Good afternoon. I'm Beth Cheney. I'm the co-chair of this event, and we're in the final stretch of today's program. I hope that everyone has been enjoying the AYA's 75th assembly as much as I have. It's been exciting to celebrate our Yale community's 100th year history of leading the way in public health. It is my distinct privilege to introduce our final speaker for this afternoon. She's a dear friend to many of us here at AYA and at Yale. She has many titles, but the one that we love here at AYA and the one that I share with her is former Board of Governor member. Marta Moret is president of Urban Policy Strategies and an organization which provides program evaluation and technical assistance to community-based health organizations. She will speak to us on what you can do to advance public health. Please join me in welcoming her. Okay, I've discovered that I can't see over that. <laughs> so, uh, has this been a remarkable day or what? <laughs> now, one workshop has not been exciting, controversial, uh, I mean, it's just been an incredible day. And I just want you to know that um, since, you know, I've had a relatively calm couple of weeks um, and haven't needed anything exciting like this, I was prepared to, you know, just go through the motions, but I'm completely passionately excited about, about what's happened. Um, so let me talk to you about, I guess my title is What You Can Do to Advance Public Health. But I wanted to first talk to you about why I personally am so excited about public health. It is a tremendous honor that Paul and Jeanette have given me to do the closing remarks here, and I can't tell you how excited I am about it. Because um, it was here in the School of Public Health that I really discovered the importance of health equity, and I discovered what poverty can do to children's health. Uh, somewhere in the 60s, just before I came to the public health school, um, I went to visit family in Puerto Rico, and a lot of my family live in that central corridor of the island that is probably the poorest and the most rural um, in the island. And um, I saw things that uh, made me feel like I said, you know, why do children have to be the victims of lack of money that results in parents having to choose for food instead of vaccinations. Why, I said to myself, do families rely on health belief models that in the long run can jeopardize further the health of children? And what kind of a government do we have in places like Puerto Rico and other countries where they are allowed through a program called Operation Bootstrap in the 30s and 40s to experiment with women on reproduction and to sterilize women as a process of that un without their knowledge? Or why is it a government would allow pharmaceuticals to uh, pollute the waters so that those toxins have an effect on the lives of children as they grow up in the future. Those are the things that I saw for the first time, having lived in, well, first the South Bronx, but then later in Litchfield County, where you don't see this kind of poverty. And I recognize I wanted to do something about that. And so I came to Yale to acquire the tools to promote this kind of health work. And today, I used to anyway, before uh, something happened a couple years ago, um, I run urban policy, policy strategies. I work in, with communities, with African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans. I work with documented and undocumented uh, citizens. And, um, and we work on on issues related to something called community participatory research in which 
I have worked with these nonprofit organizations in these communities, not just to evaluate whether the programs that they're running, whether it's a program to prevent HIV, or a program to treat substance abuse, or a program to improve maternal child care outcomes. We not only do the evaluation with them, but we make them partners in that evaluation process. So for what reason? For the best reason of all, when we finish the evaluation and I have given my report to whoever I need to give my report to, they can take those data and those data can become campaign platforms for getting more money and sustaining the programs. They can be used to educate their communities and their families. They can be used further to work with researchers to create journal articles and to move the public policy dialogue. Because after all, that's what public health is about. That's what all looking at bugs, um, talking about the Affordable Care Act, talking about art and all of that. That's what public health is about, is ultimately changing the environment in which we live. And as Jeanette says, it's daring to imagine for a better life. So the final reason why I'm in, in public health is that it links me to a man who was, at the time, equally committed to community research. And I had, we of course fell in love, we got married, and I had high dreams that we were going to join the Peace Corps, or we were going to go to South America or Africa, join our two skills in psychology and public health, and, and work on research projects. And um, imagine my surprise, look at me now. <laughs> so let me try in just a few minutes now to put all of this together for you and, and uh, see if there's some takeaway points from what we've gone through today, because there was so much today, wasn't there? And I mean, in every single one of the workshops, I don't know about you, but I wanted to stay for a lot, I was ready to stay for a lot longer and have continued conversations about what was going on. So I came up with three points um, to, to kind of, pull together the rich flavor of today in a way that I hope, and Jeanette and Paul, and I hope that you are titillated to continue work in this public health field in one way or another. Point one, there is no question after you hear Paul Cleary's remarks about the multidisciplinary work that the public health schools, the multidisciplinary environments in which the public health area um, happens, that public health is universally integrated into our lives. Even as it keeps the water clean and ensures that disease-carrying rats are no longer running around in our streets, and even as we eradicate and control communicable diseases from our midst, its presence grows ever larger in our lives. This morning, Dr. Cleary talked about a new Yale Public Health School. I think you saw that, not just in the, uh, in the uh, work that we, the, uh, saw, the film that we saw, but also in the workshops, the multiplicity of the aspects of public health. Number two, the strong use of interdisciplinary approach. There is a young woman I met at lunch, and uh, we've been talking through this because she's very interested in what the School of Public Health is going to do around environmental health and how do you get into it. Who would have thought decades ago that public health would be an integral part of environmental health, of climate change, of all the things that you have heard today. Number three, the part of that universal, universality of public health is the passion. Have you met anyone today in public health who teaches public health, who talks about public health, who sits in any of these workshops? Have you met anyone today who isn't extraordinarily passionate about this? In fact, your uh, leader of the AYA leaned over to me this morning and says, oh, now I see you, why you went to public health school. <laughs> and um, so 
We have shown that universal, universality in several ways. In education, for instance, we now know for sure, after all the back and forth around the data, that Head Start actually works. But why? Big issue is we know that children learn early in school and they get readiness skills to go on. And so that's been a big part of the research showing that, in fact, kids live better lives. But we also vaccinate children early in Head Start. So there is access to early, uh, early care. Kids are observed by teachers, and we pick up early diagnoses of learning disabilities, of mental health issues, that, and other kinds of issues that may block their ability to become successful students in school. And hopefully, what we see with the combination of public health approaches, early education approaches, we're seeing that those children grow into responsible human beings. They don't drop out. They don't become uh, pregnant out of wedlock. They don't produce, um, uh, have uh, pregnancy problems and birth problems. They don't end up unemployed. They don't end up uh, using drugs and getting into problems, ending up incarcerated, and worse, ultimately dying because of street violence. So we're seeing those kinds of potentials in a program like Head Start. So the question is, is Head Start a public health component? You bet. Absolutely. Because it fulfills those issues that you've heard some of today about social indicators of health. We are now recognizing, as you must have heard today, that health is not just about medicine. It's not just about brushing your teeth two times a day or whatever number of days you know we can do it. Um, public health is also about you can't be a healthy person if your family has no money. How are they going to make decisions about sending you to the doctor or giving you vaccinations if they're worried about money? It's always a trade-off as to what we pay for today and what we pay off tomorrow. If you're unemployed, if you're living in substandard housing, where, by the way, they're still dealing with lead poisoning, and they're still dealing with the effects of pesticides in public housing. These are the kind of things that make um, social determinants of health very important. Another piece of the universality of public health is the environment. The debate goes on about whether we're actually heading into global warming, but the data don't lie. We are seeing more incidences of respiratory illnesses. We're seeing issues related to um, uh, disease, insect diseases that are transferring to human, human um, illness. We're actually seeing more cases of melanoma and cancers as a result of the increasing changes in the, the sun's um, UVH uh, approaches. Um, and in the military, you would think public health in the military, but think about it. We are sending our young people to the Middle East, to God knows where, and what used to be an issue of combat fatigue is now post-traumatic stress disorder. It's definable, it has components, it's treatable, it's part of the mental health system that public health is involved. We also have people who are in military occupations that are having exposures in Vietnam War as Agent Orange. In some of the Middle East wars, it's respiratory illnesses related to some of the infections in uh, the sand and dirt that fly around in the environment. So we are now, as a result of public health research and, and involvement, able to address the needs of our military people and address those needs in a responsible way. Again, another, another wonderful part of, uh, of what we're doing here. And so we move to point two of public health. 
We know it's universal. We know it's gotten, it's in every aspect of everything we do. You came here thinking you were gonna learn about public health, and now you realize so much of what you do on a daily basis is related to public health. Every time you pick up the newspaper, it's related to public health. But here's the other part about public health. Public health is really unsexy. So, how many ads on television do you see for, oh, brush your teeth three times a day, don't forget to floss, um, don't forget to eat fresh fruit, uh, fruits and vegetables. I know that uh, Jeanette and I are trying to do a lot of work in the community around nutrition. You hardly ever see, except for those bars that are filled with you know, tons and tons of salt. Um, but what you do see are insurance companies and pharmaceuticals who are willing to sell you an easy cure. Don't want to lose the fat? Go get a ice sculpting or chin lifting or lip puffing or whatever it is you need to make you look better without having to give up those chocolates. Um, you have erectile dysfunction? Please don't tell me. Um, <laughs> Don't worry about it, there's a pill for that. Um, you have cholesterol problems, you want to bike into the future with your spouse and, and look healthy and young and wonderful, take a pill. But to do prevention work is harder because when we do the research, we now know that the monies that go for medications and pharmaceuticals and for insurance companies to do their work has to be approved through the federal government. Forgive me if I'm sounding like Bernie Saunders here, but um, the issue is this. When we used to testify before Congress and say, smoking causes lung cancer, and they say, so everyone who smokes, Ms. Moret, gets lung cancer? I'd say, well, the probability that they will get lung cancer is high. Yeah, but what's a probability? We want to know that there's a direct so association between that cigarette stick and the cancer that they develop. But we can't say that because we are researchers who are not going, because some 90-year-old person will hobble over into the congressional scene and say, I've been smoking three packs for 90 years and I have no cancer. So what they're more likely to fund are the interventions that are medically oriented. What we want to do is not prevent cancer, cure cancer. And so we're going to spend money to treat you through surgery, keep you in the hospital for as long as the DRGs let you stay in the hospital, and we're going to treat you with long-term chemotherapy that is costly, invasive, and depressing, if nothing else. So our, our government is more inclined to, to go into those areas than they are and working on the prevention side, only a sliver of the federal budget is committed to prevention. So you can see that the public health school and public health as a discipline is never going to go out of fashion because the idea of preventing illness, improving health is always going to be a part of this. And I think you saw this in our discussions uh, here um, today. Now, a third point, which I think is going to be, uh, which, which I, is a personal favorite of mine. I kept seeing it over and over in the discussions today. And all I could come up with is public health is like the Sir Lancelot of King Arthur's court. Whenever there is a major outbreak of something horrific like Ebola, or SARS on an ocean liner, or Legionnaire's disease, or any of those things. Who comes to the rescue covered in a white plastic sheet and gloves and a mask? Why, it's our public health people. And they look at it, they investigate it, and they get a solution quickly. Think, it is no small matter that when the Ebola crisis broke out, 
think of the infection that happened and that within 12 to 24 hours, that American individual was on a plane and in the United States with the possibility of Ebola. If we did not have the standards that we have in public health now, that person might have contracted Ebola, might have spread it to other people. So our practices and processes to prevent outbreaks of disease are indeed yeoman work on the part of Sir Lancelot of public health. OK, those are my three points. There are probably others that you can come up with. And I'm sure tonight, over drinks, we'll talk about more of them. So what is it that you can do about public health? Now, in addition to having gotten my degree in public health and being a now very permanent resident of Yale University, I am a proud alum of, uh, of the AYA. And I actually, indeed, served on the board. We had very rowdy and wonderful days on that board of governors. Um, <laughs> do not talk to anybody about it, but we were pretty bad. Um, you know, what is it that we as alums can do? We come from a wide variety of disciplines. We come to an assembly like this to learn about what a school that we may never have taken a course from or been involved in does. What would we want to do when we realize that the issues of public health are there all over the place? And so a few weeks ago, I had the distinct pleasure of giving Barbara Bush, class of 2004, the uh, Distinguished Service Award for her work in the founding of something called Global Health Corps. Um, and it was through the Yale Alumni Nonprofit Alliance. This young woman has had hundreds of young people from colleges all over the country come to Yale for two weeks, learn about public health, learn about outreach, learn about community service, and then she sends them to Europe, to Burundi, to Kenya, to South Africa. They're all there doing amazing work. And she decided to do this when she was talking with her father. You know, George. <laughs> and he and she started to uh, develop a foundation on AIDS prevention. And because he said, in, in this way that I'll never forget, that even after you've done public service as president of the United States, your commitment to public service never ends. And I can't think of a better way to do that than in serving global health. Pretty nice, considering how his father treats him in his book. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So we are seeing um, dozens of examples at Yale of young, innovative people. Could there be anything more innovative, more polished, more amazing than the young people that presented here today? Unbelievable. My mouth was agog because these are the young people that are going to change the world in the future. They so strongly believe in the innovations that they have created that I have no doubt that they will be successful. And in part, we know this as alumni, we know this as Yaleys, that when you come to Yale, you want to change the world, and that's why you come. And these kids were prime examples of that. So what would you want to do about that? Would you want to do scholarship? Would you want to be involved in finding out what happens in public health and these very different kinds of things that are going on? Um, I just want to talk a minute about one way in which you can be useful in the places from which you come. And that is, we've done a lot of talking today about global health, and I think that is 
absolutely and critically important because the world is much smaller than it ever has been. And it's important to continue strong work in global health. But let's look at our own backyard for a moment. And Jeanette knows what I'm talking about. We are in a university, a city that hosts us called New Haven. It's a great city of 350,000 people, wonderful restaurants. You could eat at a different restaurant every night for weeks. Um, it has a great government structure. It has fine housing. And when you look at some of the health indices that Jeanette and her wonderful team at CARE looked at in doing the community health assessment, you see that Connecticut doesn't look so bad compared to the rest of Connecticut, even though it's the third largest state and one of the, and the third poorest uh, town in the state. It doesn't even look bad compared to the United States around some indices. Ah, but wait, there's a rub. Look beyond the restaurants. Look beyond the wealth. Look beyond the ivied walls of Yale. Go to the places that Jeanette and I go. Anybody took the tour of New Haven? A couple of you did. Go to those places and see. What we know is this. About almost 30% of the population that live in some of these neighborhoods are African American, Latino, Native American, documented and undocumented immigrants and now refugees. They are either underemployed so that they can barely afford the insurance that the Affordable Care Act is trying to provide for them, or they are unemployed and therefore eligible for Medicaid, which is good but may have some other issues that are worth discussing. They live in substandard housing, and we already talked about lead poisoning and pesticides. Um, they um, they uh, are probably involved in all kinds of behavioral health issues that puts them at risk for all of the public health things we've been talking about, poor birth come, outcomes, substance abuse. I worked in those neighborhoods in the early 80s on HIV, AIDS, um, doing uh, education and outreach around condom use and all of that. Those individuals in, within the city of the city of New Haven should have, as Harlan said today, Harlan Krumholtz, there is a need for equitable treatment of those families. Why? Whether we think that people got poor because they wanted to be poor or they're the third generation of, regardless of any of that, you want people to excel and to be productive members of their society because number one, they do give back to the society and they do give in terms of money. But number two, we'll have fewer people in the emergency rooms who use it as the primary care setting. We have fewer people with more chronic cancer rates than the average person, higher rates of smoking and lung cancer, higher rates of colorectal cancer. More of those people may be involved in prevention programs. They may think it might even be worth it to come to a nutrition education program because they have the time and the commitment and they're not pulled in different directions for survival. So if you wanted to be involved, um, and in, I, I would like to make about three suggestions to you. Number one, <clears throat> I don't know how Jeanette will feel about this, but if I were you and I was head of my Yale club, I would be on the phone asking Jeanette Ikovitz to come out and talk to us about community public health. I would want her to talk about how do you do community health assessments? How do we know what's happening in our communities in Chicago, in Minnesota, in Austin, Texas? How do we know what's going on there? 
how do we do a community health assessment? Very few communities do that. They're very expensive. They're very time consuming. But they're an opportunity to build something that um, Paul loves to talk about, collaboration. So the communities collaborate. And from that, you can then move forward to a strategic model. Maybe look for funding from a Robert Wood Johnson or other to address some of these specific needs. So that's one avenue. And if, and if, her, um, and if her dance card gets full and she has too many of these things to do, you can always invite me to continue the missionary <laughs> statements on, uh, on this kind of thing. Number two. We now have something called the Affordable Care Act. And we had a workshop today that I think those of you who attended will probably, will, might agree with me, that it just did not cover what the Affordable Care Act is. It's a, <laughs> it's a very complicated piece of legislation that is in evolution with strong attempts to de-evolute it, 52 attempts to, uh, to get rid of this bill by the Republicans. We need to understand what it means. It's like an elephant in the room, depending on what side of the elephant you touch. Either, this is great because I'm uninsured and now I have insurance. This is not great. I'm middle class. I'm low income. And my, my insurance premiums just went up, you know, 50%. So what is it? What are the services that we're getting under it? The best thing we can do as Yaleys is learn about the Affordable Care Act. Ignorance is a dangerous thing. <laughs> it's important if you're against the Affordable Care Act to know why. And to know why, you have to know what it is and what those 900 some odd pages mean for you for families in your community, for the poor, for the rich, for the middle class. It's just imperative. This bill is in the ring. It's going to go through a lot of changes. But I will tell you something. It ain't going away. It's here to stay, regardless of what happens. And if it stays in its present makeup, it's it's got problems, and it's incomplete. And for you to be involved as strong intellectuals from this university, to be able to talk with all the legislators that you know, all the foundation and policy people that you guys know, to talk about this bill wisely, to ask important, intelligent questions about it, is imperative. Because part of that image of the future that Jeanette talks about is a future with a new kind of health care that delivers health care equitably, low cost, and universally. So know that that is coming and that will be here, and it's best to be informed about what's going to happen. OK, my third uh, suggestion to you is um, Know about what Yale is doing in public health from an interdisciplinary perspective. All of you come from different disciplines, whether it's Yale College or graduate school or professional school. And what we learned this morning is that the public health school is nothing if it is not multidisciplinary. There is now a center for law at the law school that is in partnership with the law programs here in the public health school. The School of Organization and Management is looking at this. Public policy institutions are looking at what's happening in public health. This is a great time to look and see where those multidisciplinary approaches are. Think about what you want, might want to know more of, either through online education, through uh, attending more things, to having speakers from those various places come, um, or, or in, be involved in supporting maybe a faculty member or a project that you think worthy of promoting the concept of a multidisciplinary approach in public health. 
And then the last thing I would uh, suggest to you is talk to me. I am, after all, the wife of the president. <laughs> and I am here all the time. I see the wonderful stuff that happens at Yale. Peter has to work. I have the luxury of going out to different departments, talking to alumni, to different groups, and seeing the richness of what we have at Yale. Even these past two weeks, even though Peter will talk to you about them, these past two weeks in the long run have been good for Yale. Why? Because they're pushing the envelope the way young people have to push the envelope, the way you as students at Yale push the envelope, much to the chagrin of your elders. <laughs> so I would be delighted if you you know, emailed me or called me or whatever and link you up with an interest you might have. This is how I was able to link up a young alum who was interested in starting a museum in New York City on climate change and its impact on human health. And we linked her to uh, several people at the environmental school and some people at the public health school, and she's been doing a great job. These are the kind of links that are important. Use people like me, question people. I mean, you know, Peter has a, an honorary appointment here or a real appointment, I don't know. He's at the, uh, the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on AIDS, which was not discussed too much today, but it's an important center that has looked at all of the multifaceted aspects of HIV as a global and a local issue. And, um, you know, he has done public health work looking at how people accept messages that will change their behavior. And someday, other than having him talk about emotional intelligence, you might, or jealousy, which is another one of his areas, I had nothing to do with that. Um, he, also, he also talks about how you make, what kind of messages you send out to change behavior. A quick example, you know those uh, television ads where they show someone with their throat wide open because they've been smokers and now they've got a hole? They apparently don't work. Other kinds of messages work, and he would know about that, and he would love to talk about that. So with that, I will leave you to enjoy the rest of the afternoon and look forward to seeing you all at the cocktail hour tonight. And thank you once again for coming and doing this great work. Please join me in thanking Marta and all of our speakers and presenters today for a truly insightful and energetic assembly. I do, I do have one piece of housekeeping before I have some a few closing remarks. Um, I'm told there is a hearing aid that's been uh, found, and if anyone has that, please see uh, one of the eight. AYA, um, <laughs> uh, one of the AYA uh, in the back um, if you're looking for it. Um, so uh, I don't know about you, but I've just been blown away by today's uh, assembly. We've heard some of the leaders in their field speaking on a range of topics from cancer care to climate change and a focus from New Haven to global refugee crisis. Public, he public health at Yale affects all of us, both locally and globally. And I hope that you've been ins as inspired today as I've been. I'd really like to thank my co-chair, Christine Walsh, for all her enthusiasm and support. It's really not easy for two clinicians to juggle competing schedules, but she's been great. Um, and it's really been a pleasure working with her. I hope um, that our goal was to offer you a rich, exciting assembly and highlight the School of Public Health in their centennial year. I'd also really like to thank the School of Public Health, especially Jeanette, and Heidi Richards, as well as Dean Cleary. They've just been absolutely amazing to work with. We've had just such a great time, and um, I hope that you have really enjoyed what we've had to offer you today.
and finally, it goes without saying, I'd be really remiss if I didn't really um, uh, give a big shout out to the team here at AYA. Bob Bonds, he's just extraordinary. He really, he really, he is just the, he's just the quiet, he's just the quiet force. Every time I would call him and I'd, I'd be like, Bob, how's it going? He's just, he's just absolutely extraordinary. And while my very dear friend, Elisa Masterson, um, she just really, really, really makes everything look easy. Um, I mean, this has just been a really a, a many-year dream of mine to, to be up here standing um, doing this. Um, I came to Yale uh, almost, actually almost 30 years ago now. I worked in the surgical ICU. Many of you have heard this story. And um, to, to be up here in front of you all today, with having um, co-chaired this assembly is really a dream come true. So uh, I'm just so grateful for this opportunity. Um, and as you leave here today, um, I want you to tell your story on social media. I have finally, thanks to Kevin Winston, I'm now on Twitter. Uh, within, with the, I need to tell you, within five minutes of getting on Twitter, my daughter told me to get off of Twitter. <laughs> she, I'm not even kidding you, five minutes. My daughter was like, get off, Mom. So Twitter, Instagram, hashtag Yale alumni. Uh, we'll be creating a story fi of this week's events for all of you to enjoy, um, all of the um, events that you may not have gotten to. So um, pl uh, please um, you know, continue to tell your stories throughout uh, uh, today's uh, and tonight's events and then throughout the rest of the assembly. We we'll really look forward to um, uh, hearing everything that you've had to say. Um, and then also, please join us tonight at the Yale Medal Dinner. Uh, uh, really, uh, such a highlight of uh, tonight, today's events. Uh, we can continue to um, assemble and, and, and share stories. Um, the vans will be um, outside to take people back to various hotels, and um, then we can convene at the Yale Law School dining room for uh, reception. Um, let me just see here. Then for tomorrow, um, some housekeeping for tomorrow. It's an early start, so set your alarm early. Um, if you're going to uh, be for the uh, excuse me the session with uh, Deputy Provost Stephanie Spangler and Melanie Boyd, it will be at the Yale uh, Art Gallery Lecture Hall. Um, the access will be from the York Street um, uh, entrance. The loading dock entrance from the Art Gallery will be starting promptly at 8 o'clock, so please set your alarm. Um, I believe there's been a change in the program um, for tomorrow, and you'll find a green slip in your um, in uh, the packet that you got today. And then in closing, um, I'd like to thank you for an incredible day of learning about the ways that Yale is leading the area of public health. Chris and I really, really enjoyed uh, uh, working together with everyone to um, bring you this event, and um, we look forward to seeing you tonight at the Yale Medal Dinner. And I'd just like to say, again, a big shout out to everyone, and thank you very much for letting us bring this to you. Thank you, Beth. And then I'll be very brief, but uh, let's thank Beth and Chris one more time and AYA. I just wanted to close, and I'll really be one moment. Um, it was partly um, in honor of Marta, and thank you very much. I'm, I'm a little bit embarrassed. But I wanted to, um, I just wanted to close. Uh, I've been at Yale since 1989, um, half my life, if you're looking or counting. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, I know for me and for all of us as alumni, as faculty, as students, Yale is like family, right? I mean, this is like our, our extended family. And I was at a meeting just a few months ago where Juan Martinez from the Children in Nature Network said, family are those who will join you in action. And in that way, I hope that I can count all of you as family, as family at Yale and as family to um, help us innovate and collaborate with public health. So thank you. Have a wonderful evening and rest of the assembly. I'll look forward to seeing you throughout the weekend.